Canada. I'm Andy Klein with Kansas Forest Service and I'm a streamside forester working to revegetate, reforest uh, along streams to help protect our water quality. So today we have a really exciting project going on where we're direct seeding trees and shrubs. Uh, you might be able to see a little bit next to us here where there's some rows where the trees and shrubs have been planted with this specialty nut planter. And uh, we'll follow this up with a denser seeded um, population of shrubs using just a conventional no-till drill. So the concept is that it will all grow up kind of like a shrub thicket, which will provide some great wildlife habitat adjacent to this crop field and this stream. And when erosive floodwaters come through, that shrub thicket will help slow down floodwaters above ground and the root mass below ground will help hold this eroding stream bank in place. Well, what we're really excited about with direct seeding is improving the quality of our seedings and the overall resilience rather than having a nursery grown plant that has to try and survive on its own out here now in droughty conditions or wildlife browse we're direct seeding plants that have to learn to survive on their own right from the get-go and we're seeding them at a really high density so that they can take a little wildlife damage but still end up with the stand we want and then the really great thing is so far this is showing to be quite a bit cheaper than kind of the conventional bare root planting methods. It's an exciting world in Great Plains forestry and uh, if there's any uh, opportunities you might want to explore on your own place, get a hold of us at Kansas Forest Service. We'd love to come out and visit your property and talk with you about some management options, including removing trees that maybe shouldn't be there and planting some better trees that would uh, you'd prefer to see there. I'm Ryan Arbreast. I'm the Rural Forestry Coordinator here with the Kansas Forest Service, and we are out at River Farms here near Erie, Kansas, in beautiful Neosho County uh, for our Fall Forestry Field Day. The Camburn and Schoen's families welcomed us out here to show us everything they've been doing with oak management, with pecan growing. Um, we're doing some wildland fire talks in terms of doing oak woodland burns, just a lot of cool stuff they're doing here on their farm, uh, including planning for wildlife. So it's a beautiful day. Uh, we've managed to luck out with some beautiful weather here. We've got about 130 of our closest friends of, of landowners out here to join us in learning. Uh, just a wonderful day to learn about forestry here in Southeast Kansas. I'm attending the Kansas Forestry Field Day and I've really enjoyed this event so far. We've gotten some great information from the morning sessions. I'm really excited to see what else is in store today. Okay, I'm Jesse. I'm a extension agent for horticulture down here in southeastern Kansas. Uh, I use a lot of this information from field days in my line of work because probably more than any other, uh, I get questions about trees the most out of any topical area in horticulture. So it's always good having some information to fall back on that I gain from these field days. Hi, I'm Ryan Nysis with Ecotone Forestry, attending the Fall Forestry Field Day here Erie, Kansas at Cadman Farms and uh, it's a really good opportunity for landowners to, to kind of learn a lot of different things about forestry and even wildlife or anything else. Uh, so far, like I said, we've learned, learned about fire management, timber management, wildlife management. We're going to be getting into tree plantings, uh, pecan plantations and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a good event to attend for for not only new landowners, but old landowners. And one of the big things I always enjoy about it is the networking with all your landowners as well. That's the big big reason I probably come back to and, and uh, visit, visit a lot of my landowners I've been working with for a number of years. And you always pick up something new as well. Hello, my name is Darlene Daisy. I'm a graduate student here at K-State. Um, I enjoyed my time here at the um, Forest Street Field Day. I had a great experience. I loved the view that was provided, especially the trees. Um, it was a great, <clears throat> it was a great um, classes or workshops, small workshops especially, um, gave me a great understanding of how 
uh, to manage dense forage, and I think that is something that needs to be done here on private lands. Good afternoon. My name is Tim Lyons. I'm a landowner in Douglas County, and I've been a member of the Kansas Forest Association for many, many years and involved in Kansas forestry for decades now. And I've taken advantage of so many of the services and educational opportunities over the years. And it's been just a wonderful ex experience. Uh, the, the association and Kansas Forestry has helped me in my silver culture efforts and forest stand improvement for, for so very many years. And you can tell the difference when you look into my woods. But if you enjoy the outdoors and you enjoy Kansas timber and the woodlands, I'd strongly suggest joining these organizations and attending these great field days. Um, I can't even remember how many field days I've been on over the years, uh, but probably a couple of dozen. And uh, if it's not raining, it's just absolutely a wonderful experience. Hi, my name is Dave Bruton. I'm the Utilization and Marketing Forester for the Kansas Forest Service. And today we're on K-State's campus milling up ash trees. Uh, the emerald ash borer is a threat um, to the area. It's not yet in the Manhattan area, but Kansas State University is uh, being proactive in trying to uh, remove some of the ash trees so they don't have all those trees to remove at one time. And today we're milling um, with a wood miser sawmill at the Kansas Forest Service owns. We use this for workshops and, and field days and demonstrations. And today we have it here on campus and we're milling these ash logs that have been removed, uh, like I say, proactively. And you can see here ash is a very beautiful wood. Um, here is it's kind of interesting. Here is actually where a branch was uh, pruned off. And these are herb, what we would consider urban trees because they've been grown around campus. And uh, so they've been active in pruning the trees and maintaining these trees here. And so it's always interesting to me, uh, each tree is unique. Uh, just like people, you'll never see one exactly alike. So when we mill through these, we're finding unique pieces in here. Actually, we found a piece of metal uh, in one earlier. It was a fork tree that uh, had split. And evidently in the past, they had put a bolt through that to secure it. And uh, we actually hit that on like the second pass today. So that's, that's how we started our day. Um, so that's one of the downsides of utilizing urban trees, but uh, there are lots of opportunities. Over here on the trailer, we have uh, uh, the lumber that we've milled up here throughout the day. Um, they're gonna take this lumber and, and not quite sure exactly what the project they're gonna use it for yet, but uh, they're gonna try to preserve that and use it in maybe a building project here on K-State's campus. Hi, I'm Ryan Rastock, the Forest Health Specialist with the Kansas Forest Service. And I'm here to talk to you today about calorie pear. Some of the really common cultivars that we deal with or you've heard about before, Bradford pear, Cleveland pear, a few others. Some are being developed now that you shouldn't plant. Here's the flower. Some people think it's pretty, but give it a whiff. Oh. When we're talking about trying to learn or identify this tree in the landscape, there are some pretty conspicuous features that we can look for, especially this time of year. We're in April 7th, 2023. This is when they start to bloom in their flowers. They have these very conspicuous white flowers that can uh, resemble some other native species like American plum or even black cherry to some extent. And so you'll want to be sure that you're identifying it properly. And now during the dormant season, you'll be able to look at the buds of the tree and they're really fluffy and pretty conspicuous as well. And now you take both of those features and you can kind of add it to the general structure or growth of the tree. They tend to kind of have this more erect growth habit with these narrow branch angles that uh, can cause some structural issues into the future. So you add all of those things together and that'll kind of give you the general picture of what this tree looks like. And the foliage is, is pretty nondescript, so it can be challenging from just a simple leaf to identify this species. And so now that we've introduced, you know, what this species is and what it looks like, we had mentioned talking about the branch angles on this tree. And so 
one of the things that comes to mind first among many with Bradford pear are, is, this, is this acuter tight V-shaped branch angles, which can cause a weak junction, some bark inclusion, and if there's enough force applied to those through wind or storm, then it's very common that we'll see whole branch failures in the landscape, which is not only a mess to deal with, but could pose some risk and some other things and cause some responses in that tree in the form of sprouting. And so even without damage, uh, that will initiate some sprouting. They tend to sprout very profusely internally and it's kind of a maintenance issue anyway as far as pruning and maintaining those trees in the landscape. And then aside from that, you know, the flowers that we had, had discussed, you know, they might be pretty, but really if you give them a smell, there's a really, really horrible smell associated with these flowers. And when you have these species planted as a monocrop across an entire block or neighborhood, then that smell becomes very conspicuous and quite unpleasant. And so the real reason that we're sharing this video with you other than the nuisance characteristics that I just listed for this species is that it's widely accepted and been observed to be invasive in surrounding landscapes and areas. This is a particularly in the form of woody encroachment in grasslands and fields and pastures, a, primarily adjacent to urban landscapes where it's been widely planted. And so when we see this happening, what occurs is that we get a shift in the ecosystem services in, in an overall reduction in diversity. And so this can have impacts on the animals and other plants that could have wide ranging impacts overall to our native ecosystems here in Kansas and then throughout the nation. And so we need to be very aware of where this is planted and then try to address those issues to mitigate it's, it's spread and impact into these surrounding ecosystems. So another question that I get asked pretty frequently is what is the impact, if any, on our native pollinators and on European honeybees here in Kansas from the presence of something like calorie pear? Clearly with flowers like this, they'd be very attractive and can provide a source for pollinators. But the issue really becomes when they become invasive into these grasslands and other areas and start to displace our native species, you start to get that, sp that reduction in plant diversity, which has a reciprocal impact on our other native pollinators that might depend on some of those species for some part of their life cycle. And so once they get to, once Bradford pear, calorie pear gets to that stage, then we start to see some impacts on pollinators and then reciprocal uh, ripples throughout the food chain, maybe resonating down into birds and other things throughout time. So what can you do if you have a calorie pair on your property or in your adjacent property? First of all, knowledge is power. So you can inform your neighbors and your loved ones and people throughout the community to build awareness of this species and its invasive potential. And then once that awareness is built, then we can do a few things about that, which could be remove and replace, or there's one significant type of pruning activity that I tend to advocate for, which is what we call the one cut basil prune method. You take your saw, you cut it at the base, and you cut the whole thing out, and then you're done and get rid of the stump. And then you can plant back some native or more desirable woody vegetation, such as American plum, black cherry, and there are a few other things as well that you can look about planting into the landscape. Before record, so like hello Ryan Rastog, yep. forest health specialist for the Kansas Forest Service. We're here today to talk to you about. <laughs> is that I mean, about this <laughs> cultivars or Bradford pear, Cleveland pear, and this is the flower. <laughs> ooh, actually, ooh, I actually smelled <laughs> it. Oh, I actually did smell it on that one. This oh. Yeah. And then I'll do like the title. So, so like, okay. hi, Ryan Rastock of the Kansas Forest Service, or Ryan Rastock, Forest Health Specialist of the Kansas Forest Service. Mm -hmm. Today, we're here to talk to you about calorie pear, common cultivars, Bradford pear, Cleveland pear, a few others, and a few others being developed now that you shouldn't plant. And here's the flower. Oh. I love it. 
Is that was that a good I like? I perfect. I need to quit actually spelling it though. <laughs> it's like it's like kill by dope. Just actually smell it. I think your face will do the rest. It's horrible. Oh, I'm not all stuffed up, but I'll do it. I'll take it for the team. Well, hi folks, I'm Kim Bomberger. I'm a district community forester with the Kansas Forest Service. And today we're here uh, in the grounds of the Demonstration Arboretum uh, at the Kansas Forest Service, uh, the state office here in Manhattan. Since the late 1970s, landscape-sized trees have been planted west of the Kansas Forest Service state office to honor foresters and staff who have retired or passed away while still in the employment of the agency. The earliest honored forester began his service to the agency in 1957, and planting continues today. While 134 years have passed, the Kansas Forest Service of today holds true to those objectives of promoting sound forestry practices on the Great Plains and testing new species to learn if they can survive here. Trees and shrubs have long been planted on the property for education and demonstration, but it was in uh, 2016 when more than 30 new uh, trees were introduced to the property that the agency pursued accreditation from the Morton Arbor Arboretum's ArbNet program. Folks are invited to stroll the grounds here at the Kansas Forest Service to see more than 150 tree and shrub species. All right, so we just dropped this tree. We girdled this this spring here at Milford State Park. Um, a smaller ash, it's right here next to a campground. Actually, it's kind of funny. We're feeling it right next to this uh, fire pit. Often we have folks who will bring in their own firewood from other places, and that's one of the most um, effective ways if you'd like to spread around insects and diseases from place to place. So we always try and have people uh, recommend that they, they burn local firewood. Um, so the whole idea here was that we reached out to our, our friends at Wildlife and Parks, asked if there was some, some sites at, at high uh, risk locations like Milford State Park um, that we would be able to put in some ash trees this spring. And so fortunately they're, they're great partners willing to let us sacrifice a tree here and there. So this spring came in, um, girdled this tree, which really means just we removed the bark around a section of the tree down to the xylem wood, this inner wood here. The idea here is that we're not going to kill the tree this summer, we're just going to stress it enough that it's going to be more attractive to adults of emerald ash borer, should that actually be in the area. Uh, so now here it is, we're mid-October, uh, we dropped the tree, we're going to go ahead and peel back all this bark and look to see if we find any larvae of emerald ash borer under there. They're, they're fairly distinctive, so we can differentiate them from other borer larvae that we might find in there. Uh, one additional thing we did is you might notice there's sort of a sign on here um, that's wrapped around with some uh, shrink wrap. Actually, on the back of this, we put a sticky material called Tanglefoot, um, which actually is a, is a natural resin, but it, uh, any insects that land on that will be stuck on it. So throughout the season, we can stop in and take a look at this and see if we see any adults of emerald ash borer or anything else that we think might be of interest. So at this point, we're, we're starting to peel. Right. Peel on. Okay. I'm going to... We start... This one looks pretty good. So the idea here is emerald ash borer is a cambium feeder, which means it feeds just onto this layer, just onto the bark. So we're slowly peeling back the bark and the inner bark here until we can start to see this is that, from the emerald ash borer's perspective, at least that juicy, flavorful layer of the tree where it can get all its nutrients. And we're gonna look for it right there not seeing anything so far. If we were gonna see a boar, we might start to see some sort of uh, shadow lines of wound response tissue from the tree, um, but we don't see anything here yet. I'm sure we'll find some borer tracks because there are some native borers, um, especially red-headed ash borer, that we will see show up in here. Uh, the difference between a native borer and emerald ash borer from a tree's perspective is that a native borer usually is just gonna take down stressed trees um, it's not going to kill the tree by itself. Emerald ash borer is perfectly happy to go on a really healthy ash tree and over the course of a couple of years it'll it'll kill it by itself in the absence of any other stressors, whereas we don't see that with our native borers.
it is likely the helicopter will land near the dip site to hook up the bucket. Secure any loose items for prop and rotor wash. Wear eye protection. Aircraft will reload hot or while running. It will be very loud. Use your protection. An ideal site is flat, a 75-foot clearance radius. Clear of debris or blowing dirt and sand. Keep public traffic clear and be alert to livestock in the area. Never approach from behind. Stay away from the tail rotor. Always get clear communication from the pilot to approach from the front. Keep in mind that everything is spinning and at a high rate of speed. So you've got your main rotor blade up above and you have your tail rotor in the back. Those are your main areas of danger. Always access it from the front. Always make eye contact with the pilot. Don't ever approach the machine until you've been instructed to do so by hand signals. Plus the exhaust temperature is 1200 degrees. If you're anywhere in this neighborhood, you're gonna get burned or you're gonna get chopped up. So don't ever approach from the back. Don't ever approach from any anything behind the pilot's view from the from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock. Um, if you come up to the right-hand side or you're going to get inside the machine, you always got to remember to keep your head down. This is as low as the gator blade is going to get to your head, but it's always good to, to remember to duck. And when entering the machine, make sure you put your head inside the machine first. Don't stand up inside the cockpit or the day will end poorly for everyone. So um, same thing on the exit, turn, slide out, don't stand up. The helicopter offers water to areas with limited access. While hovering, the bucket can pinpoint drops on hot spots. While flying, water can be released in a trailing drop. Filling the bucket takes minutes, making the turnaround between drops quicker depending on your water source. Here's a bamboo bucket that we use. Uh, we can dip out of ponds or other, other water sources. So this particular bucket holds about 110 to 120 gallons. Uh, usually when we're doing the dip, we would like to have at least 10 foot of water just to make sure that we don't catch anything, you know, any snags, any underground debris, sticks, algae, you know. We want to keep the inside of that bucket as clean as we can. There's a series of cables in there that, that charge the mechanism, the release door, and so we don't want to get it gummed up or, or stuck in any way, shape, or form. The bucket is connected to the helicopter's cargo hook by a synthetic long line. This allows drops to be more concentrated while limiting fire spread due to rotor wash. In case of an emergency, the pilot has a manual and electronic option to drop the line and bucket. Always remember this and stay clear of flight paths. Make sure pilots are aware of aerial hazards in your local area. If you see something, say something. If we take off and the bucket looks like it's not flying right or it's twisted or something like that, even, even if, it, if you're not sure, just make the make it known to us but sometimes they they can get twisted up or caught on something and some damage caused to it there's a, a certain way that it is supposed to fly under the wind and if it's if there's some damage to it or something is caught on it it may it may be damaged to where it, it's not going to work or drop the water correctly if you've been around the machine all day and it, it sounds one way all day long and then the last load of the day or two loads out of the, hey that sounds different than the last time please make the pilot aware of that there could be something going wrong with the machine and when you're inside the machine sometimes it's hard to tell could have some transmission problems or tail rotor damage or if, if you can hear it on the outside those little tiny changes sometimes that that could be a clue that maybe there's something wrong we should shut down and take a look at it in case of an emergency wait for rotors to stop spinning before approaching the aircraft enter the aircraft by opening or breaking the door so if something happens, you need to get us out. All it is is a quick pull on that seat belt and everything comes apart and we're out. The emergency fuel shutoff is a red, round knob located on the left side of the control panel in front of the pilot. To shut off the fuel, pull it out. The battery cutoff is a toggle switch located below the fuel shutoff. Toggle down to shut off the electrical system. Let's review. Clear at least 75 feet for a landing zone. Get clear visual communication from the pilot. Look for water sources at least 10 feet deep and clear of debris. Pay attention to the surroundings. Let the pilot know if you see anything concerning. 
Refer to your pilot for any questions. If you see something, say something. Do not rush, stay aware. For more information on aviation safety and operations on wildland fires, visit i8t.gov. So I always had an interest in woodworking. Um, I worked for the federal government for 33 years, and during that time, sort of as an aside, I was doing some, some woodworking and took some classes and things like that. Um, and when I retired, I started my own woodworking business and sort of self-taught through friends and family who did a lot of woodworking and then just through trial and error and things like that. So um, I've just always enjoyed working with things from when I was 10 years old trying to make my own skateboard. And, um, so yeah, it's kind of a second career for me. <laughs> My name is Ellen Geckler, and this is Ember Woods. I am the owner. I've been the owner for three weeks now, <laughs> but I've been working here for probably about a year and a half. Um, I, when the, the previous owner decided to move, my husband and I decided to buy the business and kind of see where we could take it. Everything is from the local area. Um, we have a few things we trade with other the mills and things like that, but the majority of what we have here is from the local area. A lot of it is farmers clearing fields that the wood would normally be burned um, or just pushed over and you know, pushed into the, the sides of the fields and things like that or burned. And um, so we've kind of put the word out. A lot of people now sell us their logs or we, we have friends that are farmers and clearing areas and uh, thinning forest areas. and and we wound up getting a lot of those logs, and so we, it's, it's all locally sourced, and then we mill it and dry it and make our goods from it. Yeah, we're, we sell quite a bit of stone. Normally what we do, we grab the logs, or people donate the logs, get the logs from us. We pick out what logs we're looking for at the time, if it's gonna be oak, cedar, whatever. We take them, run it through the mill, start cutting, which come mm -hmm. to the mill. We can run it on the mill, we cut it at the depth that you will need. This is um, a cedar log. We're cutting it at an inch and a quarter. Just uh, mainly once we get it dried, we'll make a lot of serving trays and stuff out of it. Or a lot of people put it on house mantles and put it on the siding of the houses. Or the, we cut them down smaller, take the bark off, and they're inside closets for most cedars. And it keeps most of the away once it's Once we get it dried and ready to go, we'll put it on the CNC, which is shop saber. We could flatten it, get it all flat, all smooth on both sides. Then we'll start go through and plane it or sand it, get it as smooth as we want it. Then we'll take it and take it into the shop, figure out what plans we're gonna do, make tables or stuff out of it. If we're gonna be putting the foxes in it, what we're gonna do to it. It's, where the magic happens, I guess. Mm -hmm. So we just go through, do whatever customer wants from there. From there, we put epoxies in it. I can show you that. I am Elsa Vandegevel and working up here at Ember Woods. I am their finisher. So when, as you saw Richard, when the guys get done milling it, sanding it, getting it all ready for me, it comes up front and then I do the finishes. Um, up in my room back here right now we have a blackjack oak table that we are casting because of the wood being a little punky uh, we have to cast it in rosin uh, so that it, it takes on a, a stronger uh, integrity to it so that's in the, what's in the form right now it'll set for three days from a pour I'll pour a little bit over again and then Richard uh, will take it back to the back and the guys will cut it to size bring it back to me and I'll do a flood coat over it and they'll have a beautiful dining room table. Um, so you guys finish it out legs and everything? It'll be... It, uh, sometimes the customers will buy the legs. Other times uh, Ellen will help them uh, come up with the design of legs. 
uh, we use uh, uh, several people as outsourcing on our legs, uh, but she'll help kind of help them design it. But yeah, uh, that she has made some wooden legs, but mm -hmm. usually right now, the look right now is for the custom metal legs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, those are really neat. Um, back over this way, I do some epoxy art. Uh, we have a big call for either serving trays or Lazy Susans. So I've done a, a different one over here. We do oceans, uh, some just different designs. Um, I've got uh, just different colors from the Caribbean to the Gulf, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, we are doing a called for order of a catalpa tree. Uh, and I'm from Louisiana, so I probably didn't say that like you do here. No, you did. Yep. <laughs> uh, this tree actually uh, was on the K-State uh, campus. It was one of the trees that was planted when K-State started. Unfortunately, it died, so uh, Wildcat Tree Services cut it down, and uh, the owner at the time, Scott Jacobs, uh, was able to get it, and now we try to always do something to resemble K-State in it because we we want to honor where the tree came mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. So that one is going on top of a um, bourbon barrel that's refinished, and they'll use it for um, either entertaining or tailgating. Oh. It's a big thing. Uh, no, I'm just really excited as, you know, being kind of a second career for me. I'm really excited. My husband and I kind of going in on this together. He's kind of the, the back of the house helping out with all the operations and things. I'm sort of the front of the house helping doing the the books and the woodworking and things like that so it's really exciting for both of us to sort of start a new venture and kind of make a go of it be part of the, the riley county community and here in downtown riley it's it's a really nice small community uh, but close to manhattan we also have customers from some of the bigger cities around that, and we've had people from dallas and austin and colorado kansas city wichita so we get we get people from quite a, a, an array of areas kind of the greater central Kansas area and, and uh, it's just it's really nice to, to sort of see where it's going to go. Hi I'm Ryan Rastock, the Forest Health Coordinator with the Kansas Forest Service and today we're looking at the Catalpa. This is a really interesting tree. They tend to grow fairly large. They'll get a very nice large crown or canopy of the tree. We call it a decurrent growth habit. Uh, the leaves are very conspicuous. They're what we call a chordate or heart-shaped leaf, uh, very large. And then the fruits, they tend to kind of mature throughout the season. So we're earlier, we're here in late August, and as the season progresses, these long cylindrical type of fruits will kind of darken and the outer part will darken. Um, the wood on Catalpa is fairly rot resistant and very sturdy. You'll tend to see cavities kind of forming in this in these group of trees, but it, the, the risk involved with that doesn't tend to be as elevated as in other species with a softer type of wood. So here we go, Catalpa. Well, my name is Dave Bruton. I'm the Utilization and Marketing Forester for the Kansas Forest Service, and Dave Prescott, um, has a walnut hauler. It's first year he's, he's had that established. I talked to him a few years ago about uh, um, getting a hauler and possibly adding that to kind of his offerings here. He has a sawmill and a kiln and does woodworking projects. And so the fall is a great time for people to come out and kind of visit and see those sorts of things. But um, the Kansas Forest Service, we try to promote, you know, the forest products that we have here in the state. And uh, Walnuts are one in particular that oftentimes I get calls into the office this time of the year where people have twisted their ankle or hit, hit the nuts with their lawnmower and broke a window or something like that. Most people will put up with walnut trees in their yard or landscape for a few years, but eventually something like that's going to happen. They're going to twist their ankle. They're going to you know run over with a car or something. And, and so they, they're looking for opportunities to, to do something with that material. And, uh, People like David having this hauler uh, provide that opportunity. We have six hauling stations this year across the state of Kansas. Uh, David's ha happens to be the furthest west uh, hauling station in the United States. Uh, Hammond's Products Company provides the hauler hauling machine, and then David operates that. But it's kind of interesting that he's the furthest one in the United States. And so I'd like to have these haulers spread out, you know, across the landscape here in Kansas in the fall time in a reasonable distance where people don't have to drive very far, but 
Uh, David's finding that people are coming in from Wichita and Kansas City, Manhattan, uh, so driving in for a considerable distance. And just the fall time is a great time for people to be out and enjoy the weather. And some people just enjoy picking up the nuts, even if they're not making money, they're at least paying for some of their gas maybe to, to get here. So uh, again, we as the Kansas Forest Service really like to promote the utilization of our resources here in the state and uh, great opportunity for, for you know scouting groups or 4-H groups or community organizations to, to gather up walnuts that are falling in their community and try to utilize those. So glad to have David having the machine here this year and, and uh, he's, he, he can tell you more about how many pounds and all that sort of stuff he's accumulated, but uh, it does add to the economy um, and a way to utilize the resource as well. Yeah, I want to thank Dave for getting me started in this uh, project. Uh, he got it with me a couple years ago, and uh, my grandson, just like everybody else, we started figuring out that these walnuts laying around have a little bit of a cash value. Plus, also get them cleaned up in the yards. But uh, yeah, so uh, I contacted Hammond's uh, Walnuts out of Missouri and, and uh, did a little contract with them. They set up the machine, and, uh, and we've been advertising a little bit, getting going. Knew this first year might be a little short. Next year, I got a feeling it'll probably double. <clears throat> but what it does is does give a cash inflow into the local area and the people that do it something that's there it's great for you to get started on this little pile of walnuts right here constitutes just right around six thousand dollars there's twenty two thousand five hundred pounds of walnuts sitting here right now so just by doing that for the last three weeks and we've got two more weeks to go november 14th will be the last day we accept nuts uh, but anybody that wishes to contact me, my phone number is 785-219-9475. Contact, and I'll fill you in on any other information or where you're at. Maybe you need to be closer to Lawrence. There's people over there that deliver nuts, uh, uh, too, and uh, can help you out get that project done. Um, well, it started out right after World War II. I think the, the original owner uh, or owners... They came back from the war and all these walnuts were laying around and so they thought they should somewhat come up with some use and um, actually they they get a, quite a little bit of money out of the shells you know side of it they actually make so when more they, money out of the shell than they do the meat when they crack it they'll pull the meats out mm -hmm. but then they've got the shells and so it's in makeup removers uh, if you look the grit part of it um, and several years ago when they were redoing the statue of liberty i can't remember if that was around you know 2000 whether that was kind of a big deal then or what but anyhow they used the holes to sandblast mm -hmm. the statue of liberty because they didn't want to have a bunch of sand or so now you know, it's kind foreign of material it's now using this as a, as a blasting habit. and people use them we've got one guy that um well keith lynch that does a lot of reloading of shells oh, yeah. and so they use that for tumbler. for yeah. in the tumbler, in the tumbler. Uh, yeah. clean the brass yeah, yeah. so there's all kinds of products the neat part of that story is the first year they advertised buying walnuts they bought right around a hundred thousand pounds but they didn't even have equipment yet to figure out how to process them. So they had this learning for Now it's high tech and now they go through a hundred thousand pounds of these nuts every day. Wow. Every day they're operating. And they've got an eye on there that if it picks up something that's a little bit darker as far as the meat, a puff of air, at least last time I was yeah. over there and it's been several years ago, but it, the, all the nut meats are going across a, a conveyor system basically and if, it, if that eye picks up something that's darker or kind of a foreign material, it sends a puff of air out and it blows that off of the, the conveyor. I mean, this stuff's going by really fast. It used to be they did it all by eyesight and just had to pick out, you know, the poor meats in there, but they, now they're... They still are using eyesight some, though. They've yeah. still got conveyor yeah, belts and women just sitting people. there picking. Yeah. pretty neat. It's quite an go. operation. You've been there. I have. I want to yeah. go. Yeah. Yeah. I will go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah pretty good operation but they bring the machines out they set them up for people um and there's six of them in the state right now and so uh oh you know, i'd like to have more of them because most fuel prices being the way they are right now it'd be nice to have these spread out about every you know 35 miles or checkerboard sure. across the landscape um because you know i mean he's had people coming from wichita and kansas city but by the time you they just kind of enjoy doing it by the time you figure their fuel costs, unless they're coming to visit family or something in the area anyway, you know, that's a, you're probably breaking even in some cases or maybe even losing, losing. money. Yeah. Um, I felt bad for the guy yesterday that drove all the way from North Kansas City. I flipped him an extra 20. I'm going, buddy, <laughs> you've had a bad day. I gave him 20 extra. But uh, uh, I am the farthest west 
net receiving station in the United States. There's nothing west of me at all. So uh, just another little bit of trivia. Yeah. First time we've done one in western Kansas. Um, so as the Northwest District Fire Management Officer, this is a great opportunity to get western Kansas exposed to the work that the Forest Service does and the services we can provide from fuels work, uh, prescribed fire, and then also good fire training opportunities for local departments and other agencies. This wildlife area is pretty unique to western Kansas. Most people think of western Kansas as flat farm fields and pastures. There's a lot of topography here, a lot of history from Native Americans, even a lot of, of history from wildlife and parks. We've been wanting to have prescribed fire in here for years and when I got the opportunity I jumped on it to partner up with the Forest Service. We as the older generation have an obligation to provide great mentorship to those that are going to replace us in the future and those are our future leaders and giving them the right tools that they need to be productive and successful in their career comes from very experienced and knowledgeable people that's training them. Here, it's all live action. You are seeing everything that you learned throughout the year put to use as far as safety and topography and you know types of fuels and stuff like that. Now you can see it all as it's happening right in front of you. If you're not used to being on your feet, then that's going to be an issue for you. This is actually still a county road. There's a lot of dead trees that uh, are hazardous. If wind comes up, it could be fatal. Be hydrated. <laughs> yeah, be prepared. Make sure be you prepared. bring warm clothing. <laughs> warm clothing, good shoes, good socks. Operations on a fire that involves a structure is completely different than a wildland fire. The tools are different, the, the operational periods are different, and so realizing that water is a limited resource. And so having training in both just allows that information, wherever I go and learn that, to bring it back to my home community, uh, help train our firefighters, and so we're better prepared to handle those types of emergencies in our county, and then help others uh, when they're in need as well. Prescribed fire is going to be less intense. We're not going to kill as much woody vegetation. We get nutrient cycling in the soil from, from burning the grass. If we ever had lightning strike or something get, get in here and have a wildfire, it would wipe out a lot of stuff. Potentially private lands close to it, uh, burn up pastures. and We'd have fuels in here, as in trees, it would burn for probably a month.
you can imagine taking 19 individuals, most of them, this is their field day, their first hands-on experience of any kind of firefighting duties. And to have leadership or the mentors in place in that leadership to be able to function and get a functioning crew together that is very productive in five days is a challenge and on this mitigation project that was accomplished. helping us in an area where I'm not comfortable burning. It's just, it's too big of a project for me to take on, so the partnership, it's invaluable to me, really. Two-thirds of Kansans are reliant on the rivers, streams, and reservoirs of Kansas to provide them with a safe and plentiful supply of water for home, agricultural, and industrial uses. Properly functioning riparian areas play a critical role in surface water supply, and Kansas Forest Service is committed to providing the expertise to Kansas citizens and governmental entities to establish and enhance native vegetation riparian areas. One such program is the State of Kansas Interagency Stream Bank Protection Team. The Stream Bank Team, formed by the Kansas Department of Agriculture, the Kansas Water Office, and the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, works to reduce the amount of sediment entering rivers and reservoirs by engineering and installing stream bank protection projects that use a combination of rock revetments, wood revetments, and re-establishing permanent native vegetation. Given that demand for such work greatly outweighs available funding, the state prioritizes this work by focusing their efforts in the watersheds of Tuttle Creek Reservoir, Perry Reservoir, and John Redmond Reservoir. Stream bank protection sites within those three watersheds are then evaluated on erosion rate and landowner willingness to participate. The sites contributing the most sediment to the rivers and reservoirs are selected first to have their bank reshaped and engineered rock structures installed in order that native vegetation can be permanently established. In the time that Kansas Forest Service has gotten involved, establishment success has greatly increased and revegetation costs have been decreased. We currently have 98 sites covering 158 acres and protecting 17.3 miles of river and another 18 sites covering 41 acres, protecting 4.1 miles of river, will be planted in the next 18 months. The location you'll see here is known as BBR 49 and is located just north of Marysville, Kansas, along the Big Blue River above Tuttle Creek Reservoir. Aside from the state's stream bank protection program, Kansas Forest Service continues to provide the same repairing forestry planning services to other landowners all throughout the state. We are pleased to play a role in protecting and improving water quality and quantity for all Kansas residents. So Kansas Forest Service comes in um, really at the beginning in the planning phase to meet uh, with the designer as they're designing these projects. Um, and then I work with the uh, excavating contractor as they're doing the excavating portion of the projects. And then it really becomes ours though at this point in time when, uh, when the replanting starts to happen. So I write the planting plan and, um, and, and contract out the planting to forestry contractors and then oversee the establishment maintenance of the of all these plantings to make sure weed control is getting done and uh, uh, these plantings get established well enough to kind of be self-sufficient after three to five years or so 
So yeah, Kansas Forest Service is kind of the vegetative contractor in a way, and and we sub part of that out, but we just are here to ensure that trees and shrubs and native grass get reestablished on these sites that have been suffering from stream bank erosion. As you can imagine, this was an eroding bank, so it was, or it was straight up and down. And uh, so they came in, first thing was place the rock weirs angling upstream because the rock weirs help redirect the flow of water. And so that kicks the water back out into the middle of the channel rather than having it flowing really fast and strong right up next to the stream bank mm -hmm. and your road more dirt away. The next thing they did is they placed rock. We can't see it because most of it's actually filled in with sediment already, but place rock in between each weir right at the on the water's edge. And that is a resistive force for the water that still is flowing right next to the bank. That uh, helps resist erosion there. And then the vegetation side of things is also resistive. So here we're at kind of two thirds of the way through this project where the rock has been placed um, both in the weirs and along the edge. That's called longitudinal peaked stone toe protection or LPSTP. So they do that and then I guess I forgot to mention too that the bank is shaped at a three to one slope. So um, that there's physically not a bunch of heavy soil way up on the very top edge of a bank that wants to calve off like a glacier. And uh, so that kind of helps uh, just with kind of more mechanical stability. But more importantly, it gives us a place to grow vegetation. So back to that resistive thing, those two R's of redirecting and resisting flow of water. So that gives us a spot to, to plant something. And right now there's a lot of weeds or first responders here. Um, but there is grass seed that was uh, seeded here. Um, we'd have to dig through the mulch to see if it is coming, but I imagine it is starting to come. Um, but a mix uh, of native grass seeds and a uh, nurse crop like oats or wheat was probably thrown in there too. And then of course the uh, shrubs are getting planted all throughout the length of the slope right now. We've got water loving shrubs in the false indigo and the button bush down next to the water's edge that can withstand being underwater for a while. They can withstand being bent over by floods and they'll spring back up. Um, so they'll be down next to the water's edge and then as we transition up out of the channel then we get into uh, other species and um, up here we're planting plum because uh, a plum shrub is you know just a fantastic sieve of flood water or strainer of flood water mm -hmm. it's so thick that as water flows out over the bank down there that plum thicket will help slow down the force of water and it will help catch uh, flood debris any driftwood and stuff so that's going to keep the crop field cleaner here following a flood and less flood debris to clean up um, so our our slope vegetation is takes the brunt of it and we want that to get established as fast as possible. Um, and then at the top of slope on out into the field here, we've got our 66 foot wide buffer area that um, was seeded to a cover crop. And uh, then we'll no-till seed into this in the spring, a mix of tree and shrub seed that, um, that this will then grow up and act like a shrub thicket for the first 15 years, mm -hmm. but then the trees will keep growing and and become a forest eventually mm -hmm. this site has been great because it's already captured a bunch of sediment and that's exactly what it's supposed to do if we weren't in here to revegetate there would probably be some flood that would come and wipe out that sediment maybe not the next one maybe the next mm -hmm. one after that could be the next one yeah. we just don't know the rock does have a lifespan uh, because after about 15 or 20 years of freeze thaw cycles, it's going to be broken down mm -hmm. and um, not be able to redirect the water, resist the water like it does brand new. So it does do a really good job though in those first 15 years or so, and that allows the vegetation to get reestablished. Just like down there where we see some willows already starting to come, um, that uh, 
that was just a real small patch of willows, but it's already expanded because those weirs are kicking the water out away and not tearing out the patch of willows every time a flood comes through. So that, that patch of willows has already been able to expand and it'll continue to ex expand. Mm -hmm. And uh, so yeah, if we can get vegetation on these slopes then to hold the loose soil in place and fill in, and then eventually that vegetation is going to start catching sediment mm -hmm. and silt. And um, the oldest site that was done is in Kansas is right up on the state line upstream of here on the Little Blue River. This is the Big Blue. But um, it was shaped to actually a four to one slope, so a little flatter than this slope here. And you walk out there now, you walk from the buffer area, the flat field, out to the buffer area, and you're not walking down a steep slope, you're walking down a real gradual grade to the edge of the river because the trees and shrubs and grass on that slope caught so much sediment over the over the past 25 years now um, that it has built that slope back up and now that slope is a little more naturally stable or it's more stable a little more of a natural um, Kind of self stabilization mm -hmm. has happened with that rock uh, vegetation in place. Very cool. Yeah. Once the aircraft is ordered, a ground crew will begin travel to the refill location. Until they arrive, local personnel will assist the pilot to reload water. Remember, pilots cannot see directly in front of the plane. Do not park or stand directly in front of the planes. A good rule of thumb is to keep a 10-foot buffer from the wingtips. Secure any loose items for prop and rotor wash. Wear eye protection. Aircraft will reload hot or while running. It will be very loud. Use your protection. Get clear visual communication from the pilot for approach and refilling. Too much pressure will damage the aircraft. Use idle pressure from a truck or a gated valve from a hydrant. The pilot will provide the adapter. Always take extra caution when working with aircraft. Mishaps can be deadly. When I pull into the loading pit, I would like somebody directing the aircraft into the pit so I don't hit anything. I cannot see the wingtips because the engines are in the way. When you approach the aircraft, stay outside of the wing and behind it. The pilot will provide a three inch cam lock to a standard fire hose fitting. Okay, this is the retardant tank on this aircraft. It goes from here up to here. These two valves here are pretty important for loading. They're, they're the level valves, and they're controlled at the back when you're loading the aircraft. We hook up right here with the hose, just like that. Notify the pilot you are flowing water. Too much pressure will damage the aircraft Use idle pressure from a truck or a gated valve from a hydrant. Open these two level valves, which I showed you up there. This will be the low level, about 600 gallons. This will be the high level, 800. When these lights are on, those valves are open. That tells you how full the tank is when water runs out the valve. It starts to run out the lower valve. You can close it, the light goes off. Both tanks, all 800 gallons, can fill in about three minutes. Start shutting down your water once the lower level valve runs. Once the lower tank level valve runs, you have about 45 seconds before the top tank is full. The time between uh, water coming out the high level valve and overflowing the tank with the probability of rupturing the tank you need to have a quick acting shutoff valve you can't screwing down a hydrant takes too long when it 
runs out the top valve. You quit loading the aircraft, shut the valve, and disconnect the hose. Once the tanker is full, walk out around the wing so you can see the pilot in the cockpit. Check the area and clear them for takeoff. In case of an emergency, enter the plane from behind the wing, through the door, or the rescue window on top of the cockpit. The seat belt unlatches and all straps release. There are three emergency shutoffs. First, cut off the engines. Located on the control panel in front of the seats, rotate the red levers to the outside and pull the knob in the middle out. Next, pull back the fuel mix levers on the cockpit ceiling. Finally, on the ceiling behind the seats, rotate the red handles so the point faces back to shut off the fuel. Let's review the refilling procedure. Clear the loading area and direct the plane in. Safely approach the plane and get the adapter. Remove the port cap. Attach the fitting to the plane and the water source. Notify the pilot you are starting to fill. Flip the valve switches on. Begin to flow water. When the bottom level valve runs, begin to shut down your water. Remove your hose and the adapter. Replace the port cap. Signal the pilot he is full and clear them to taxi to the runway. Refer to your pilot for any questions. Also, if you see something, say something. Do not rush, stay aware. For more information on aviation safety and operations on wild land fires, visit iat.gov. Hi, I'm Tim McDonald, a Community Forestry Coordinator with the Kansas Forest Service. And today we're here at the John C. Pear Horticulture Center in Hayesville, Kansas. And we're going to talk about a pine that's native to the southwestern United States. It's called Southwestern White Pine, Pinus strobiformis. Well, we actually are recommending it as a windbreak plant or as a landscape accent uh, for screening and that. Uh, it grows to be about 50 foot tall, about 30 foot wide. Uh, Probably the biggest specimens we have right now are probably 25, 30 foot tall. What we've seen so far is it's a drought tolerant plant. It doesn't have the needle blight diseases that you're going to find in Austrian and some of the other disease or other pines. Uh, white blister rust is the only thing you see in it in the native range, but we have not seen that around here. Uh, fairly fast growing pine, a little bit intolerant of wet soils, so you don't want to put it in wet soil, it's, and it's also intolerant of being shaded. So it needs full sun, well-drained soils. It cannot grow in a waterlogged soil or be overwatered, so kind of maybe stay away from the heavier soils. The only disclaimer I've got to give on southwestern white pine or any pine in general is that we can't really guarantee any pines against pine wilt. Um, we have not necessarily found it in southwestern white pine yet. We have found it in eastern white, but not southwestern white so far. Another advantage of this plant would be that it's not going to have the encroachment issues of eastern red cedar. You know, we're getting a, a, a lot of talk about that. Um, this plant will not readily reseed itself or be distributed by birds or anything like that. So that is another plus. I'm Ryan Armour. I'm the forest health coordinator with the Kansas Forest Service, and I really just want to encourage you to consider mulching your trees. It's one of the best things we can do to really help increase our trees' vigor uh, and their resiliency going forward for all of our community trees, like all these small trees that we've got here uh, with nice, nice big mulch rings around them. I'm over here by a really nice uh, red oak we planted. This is a cherry bark oak. Um, and we've mulched this one with some arborist mulch chips that we got from a tree crew that was coming through town uh, doing some utility line clearance. So we as the city and anybody in the city was able to get a bunch of this mulch for free, uh, which is nice. But I also like this mulch for another reason. Instead of being really fine ground, um, they could actually kind of mat down, create a layer that would uh, keep water from being able to actually penetrate into the root system of the tree. Um, it's a little chunkier, which does a couple things. I like that more coarse grain nature because it allows some air circulation and water penetration 
but it also on a breezy day like today helps keep this mulch from blowing away. Really fine grain mulch like this can sometimes blow and, and we could lose it, but this larger um, uh, pieces of mulch like this, I, I actually like this because it kind of nests together and, and hangs together and doesn't blow away as easily as some of the really fine grain ground mulch can. All right, so one of the trees we planted here in our city park a couple years ago was this nice sycamore to give us some shade. A uh, nice fast growing tree and uh, we don't have any uh, picnic tables or anything under here that could be a target if it has a branch break out of it. Um, we mulch this as well and one of the things that uh, sometimes happens when you dump mulch, especially with wheelbarrows, is that is you end up with what we call a mulch volcano. We definitely don't want this, all this mulch up against the trunk of the tree can hold moisture against that um, the, the bark and, and that's not going to be good for the long-term health of the tree. So I think more about mulch donuts or mulch bagels as opposed to mulch volcanoes where you kind of pull that mulch out away from the base of the trunk a little bit where you're looking for two or three inches of, of mulch out here against uh, um, over the roots um, and really nothing right up against the base of the tree against this root flare. Um, that's more what we're looking for. So I, I think donuts, not volcanoes. So a few years ago, we planted this nice tree lilac right behind this bench that a lot of parents will sit at and watch their kids play at the park, um, which actually led to this case where it was hard to maintain the grass between the tree lilac and, and the bench. So we actually mulched this entire area, which is gonna be great for the tree. It's really gonna help um, that tree's root system um, not have to compete against grass, but it also makes it easier for our city supervisor to not have to come in and, and try and uh, mow in this really narrow area here. So this is another example that I like where mulch is really fulfilling a lot of purposes for us. We're getting better trees, easier maintenance. Um, it's really a win-win situation, we think. Mulching is great for trees of any size. I'd encourage you to consider mulching out to the drip line of any trees, um, but it's especially great for smaller trees they're really trying to get established and compete uh, at a young age so they can grow and uh, maintain a good vigorous growth rate for you. Uh, but really any mulch that you can give to a tree is really gonna benefit. So I'd, I'd encourage you to consider mulching your trees. Uh, any time of year is great, but uh, sooner rather than later. Welcome everyone, I'm Chris Mullins, District Forester for the Kansas Forest Service, and today I wanna to be talking to you about five of my favorite trees from our conservation tree list that really benefit wildlife, in particular deer. Just a disclaimer, some of these trees can't be planted throughout the whole entire state, so if you wanna to check to see which tree is right for your soil type, please contact your local district forester or visit our website at www.kansasforest.org. All right, let's get this list started. All right, coming at number five is the swamp white oak. This is a tree that is found from the central to the eastern part of the state. Really likes riparian and wet areas. It is a moderate to fast growing tree. The acorn is extremely sweet, but the only negative I have about this tree, it does take about 20 years for it to reach maturity. So this is a tree you'd wanna plant for your kids and your grandkids to enjoy later down the road. Coming number four is the red mulberry, the big guy behind me. This tree is found throughout the majority of the state. It is a faster growing tree and it starts producing fruit about that three to four year range. The fruit is awesome for wildlife, deer and humans. And the deer love the new shoots and the new sprouts and the new leaves from the red mulberry. It's a great firewood tree, great windbreak tree, great wildlife habitat tree in general. Coming in number three is the chinkapin oak. The chinkapin oak is found from the central to the eastern part of the state, has a moderate to fast growth rate and it really starts producing acorns about that five to eight year range. The acorns start dropping in September to early October so this makes a great deer tree and a great wildlife tree in general. Coming in number two is the sawtooth oak. This tree is found from the central to the eastern part of the state, has a faster growth rate comparatively speaking for an oak and it is a fast acorn producer. It starts producing acorns around that four to six year range and it is one of those trees that good luck beating the squirrels and the raccoons and the possums to that acorn because they pick it up and vacuum it up like crazy. The only negative I have about the sawtooth oak is it does hold on to its leaves a little bit later in the year and sometimes can break up in the ice. Otherwise, it's a great all around deer tree. Coming in number one isn't an oak at all. It is the persimmon tree, which is found from the central to the eastern part of the state. It has a moderate growth rate and it starts producing fruit about five to nine years of age, even sooner if you get a grafted version of the persimmon. The persimmon fruit in general has a sweet nutty flavor to it and it starts to get ripe late September all the way to early November, depending on the weather. So that is why the persimmon is the number one tree for me on the conservation tree list for deer. Just like every habitat manager will tell you, variety is key when it comes to wildlife habitat and deer habitat. 
So if you have any questions about which trees and shrubs to plant, please contact your local district forester or give us a call. Thank you for watching and we'll see you around. A future forest starts with good seed and getting good seed takes a lot of work. This burnt oak here, I'm taking through the process of cleaning it from <clears throat> sticks and leaves and all kinds of other debris that, that we just happen to pick up while out collecting. Um, so cleaning it and then being able to do some quality control work on it. Uh, about 6,000 pounds of burr oak is what we've been processing this year. And some of it is going to go into direct seeding projects where we're planting acres and acres of seed right in the ground and up, up, the rest of it will go for our greenhouse production of seedlings. But uh, so here today to clean this seed, uh, I am using a method that I like to call power winnowing. Up here is a hopper bottom bin full of dirty boat burr oak seed. And this is an empty bin and I'll just flow the seed out of there and just like uh, the, the first uh, wheat producers did with winnowing baskets, I'll let the seed flow through with a stream of air blowing through and hopefully cleaning out that seed. So here we go. <laughs> Well, spring is finally here, and with the daffodils and tulips in bloom, along with the red buds, crab apples, and forsythia, now is a great time to go for a walk in the woods. It's not too hot, and the filtered sunlight coming through the trees is easy on the eyes. Later in April and May, the buckeye and wild cherry will be in bloom. Looking down now, you'll see a multitude of wildflowers growing and blooming, like violets and bluets. Most woodland flowers grow and bloom before the tree leaves have fully expanded to shade them, while their open prairie counterparts bloom during the summer. After we get a good soaking April rain, it will be prime time to look for edible morel mushrooms. These delicacies are usually found in streamside woodlands under elm and cottonwood trees. Be sure to hunt them with an experienced morel picker the first time you go, and don't eat any mushroom without confirming that it is a safe species. After a spring rain is also when cedar apple rust galls open to spread their spores. While not really a treat, the orange gelatinous tendrils that burst forth from the galls are slimy and gross enough to fascinate most six-year-olds. This is also a visual reminder to apply fungicides to susceptible crab apples or hawthorns in your own home landscape. So this spring, go for a walk in the woods to see if you can find any visual or edible treats. If it's a windy day, be alert for broken branches still left hanging from the winter storms. These will continue to break loose in fall and could be hazardous. Be warned also that ticks are getting active as temperatures warm up and mosquitoes too. So take precautions with clothing or repellent to protect yourself from becoming a treat for the local bug population.
Once the aircraft is ordered, a ground crew will begin travel to the refill location. Until they arrive, local personnel will assist the pilot to reload water. Remember, pilots cannot see directly in front of the plane. Do not park or stand directly in front of the planes. A good rule of thumb is to keep a 10-foot buffer from the wingtips. Secure any loose items for prop and rotor wash. Wear eye protection. Aircraft will reload hot or while running. It will be very loud. Use ear protection. Too much pressure will damage the aircraft. Use idle pressure from a truck or a gated valve from a hydrant. Get clear visual communication from the pilot for approach and refilling. The pilot will provide the adapter. Always take extra caution when working with aircraft. Mishaps can be deadly. When the airplane lands, for safety, we want everyone to stay behind this trailing edge of this wing. Your place to be is between the wing and the tail. Move toward the airplane until it is completely stopped. Always keep an eye on the pilot. When he motions for you to come in, then you could come up with this fitting on your hose. Then you'll just walk up here. This is a three inch cam lock. Snap it on that there. Once you have that on the airplane, what you want to do is you want to take your thumb and push this stainless steel over and pull this lever up to here. That is open. That is closed. It doesn't go any further than that. Don't try to force it any further. It will break it. So open and closed. Too much pressure will damage the aircraft. Use idle pressure from a truck or a gated valve from a hydrant. Once you hook the fire hose to the airplane, this valve has to be open. Then go back and open the valve on the hydrant or the truck. You want to start slow. You don't want a lot of RPMs on the truck. You want to be pumping the water slow. You want to keep an eye on the pilot, and he's going to tell you that you can speed it up a little bit. He's gauging that off the flow coming into the hopper. These airplanes can't take all the pressure. So this is the overflow tube of the hopper, this thing right here. There's one on each side of the hopper. So if, you, if the airplane does get overloaded, water's gonna run out this tube right here. If you're on the ground and you see water running out of this tube, it's the overflow. We try not to overflow them, so, if, so we'll try to cut it off before that happens. If it does overflow, don't panic, it's fine. Just get the water turned off at the engine or at the hydrant. Once the pilot waves you off and says, okay, I'm full, I don't need any more, and you want to shut that off at the hydrant or the gate valve first. Then you want to walk back over to the airplane. The next thing you would do, as long as there's no pressure on the line, you would shut this valve and unhook this cam lock and walk away. In case of an emergency, enter the plane through the cockpit door or windows. The seat belt unlatches and all straps release. There are two emergency shutoffs. First, locate the red fuel lever inside the door panel. Rotate the arrow around so the point is towards off. Next, turn off the battery power. Located on the control panel in front of the pilot, it is the only key. Rotate it counterclockwise to the off position. Let's review the refilling procedure. Clear the loading area and direct the plane in. Safely approach the plane and get the adapter. Attach the fitting to the plane and the water source. Carefully open the plane's valve. Notify the pilot you are ready to flow water. Slowly and controlled, begin to flow water. The pilot will signal when the plane is full. First, shut down the water source. Then, close the valve on the plane. There should be no pressure on the line when the valve is closed. Remove the adapter and your hose. Clear the area for them to taxi to the runway. Refer to your pilot for any questions.
Also, if you see something, say something. Do not rush, stay aware. For more information on aviation safety and operations on wildland fires, visit iat.gov. I'm Ryan Rastock with the Kansas Forest Service. I'm the Forest Health Coordinator for the Kansas Forest Service. And today we're gonna to be talking about this tree here, the Kentucky coffee tree, Gymnocletus dioecus. It's a very interesting tree native to the kind of the Eastern half or third of the state. It's really interesting in that it has one of the largest leaves of any tree in the state. So it's a bipinnately compound leaf. Uh, they can be up to four feet in length. Uh, you can see here, this is the entire leaf breaks off into another set of a compound leaflet and then you have the smaller leaflets here so that would be the entire leaf um, it is in the bean family family so it's a legume and so around october you're going to see these conspicuous bean pods that are kind of blackish in color uh, and we'll show some images of that in a bit and uh, with that some of the uses had been speculated that perhaps some of the settlers in the past had used it as a coffee substitute I can't verify or refute that or attest to the quality, so we're certainly not encouraging you to do that. But, um, and with that too, the, uh, the bark, so typically in a wooded situation, these can grow in those low light conditions and grow kind of really straight and slender. And the bark is kind of a grayish color when they're more mature in this really large tree here with these conspicuous furrows. Now, oftentimes it'll almost kind of have an exfoliating type of bark where it almost peels back a little bit and hopefully we'll be able to see that in a bit. Um, it's growth habit, it grows pretty well in urban areas. And then also in the forested lands in Kansas, you're gonna see it typically associated with areas where black walnut will grow pretty well. And so that is the Kentucky coffee tree, Gymnocletus dioecus. <laughs> then another consideration with Kentucky coffee trees, they tend to be prolific root sprouters. So behind me here, we have a pretty conspicuous uh, clustering of sprouts that are originating from the roots, they can actually start to sprout out throughout the whole root system. Uh, and so a lot of people will wonder, you know, what to do about it in an urban setting in your front lawn if it's starting to sprout a lot. You certainly don't want to apply herbicide if you want to keep that tree alive as it's connected to that root system. Uh, and if you're in a forested setting or something like that and want to encourage that to kind of get a grove of uh, Kentucky coffee to establish and you can just, just let it go, maybe selectively thin them out if you like. So. trees in here like here's one that was a hackberry that was uh, guys come in and girdled to, to kill and here's another one because it was too close to this nice little walnut that I see the deer come <laughs> and worked on you know but uh, it, it's alive it'll be fine but this little walnut was one that we wanted to uh, enhance and protect and there's another little walnut right there and they wanted to, to enhance so the plan was to kill everything that was close and or shady and would be competition to these little trees Some of these in here, and we'll, we'll walk through. These were planted uh, 22 years ago. 22. I planted them on the month that our first grandchild was born, uh, Austin. And so th this is what I call this Austin's forest, <laughs> you know, because uh, this this is a 22-year-old walnut here, and then. Uh, over here, here's a, uh, an elm tree that was girdled. Uh, Harold's mark is on it, indicating that's a tree to be killed because it's adjacent to this little bur oak that I planted 22 years ago. So we came in, you know, a long time ago and again cut some of the invading trees that were in here. And, uh, and and planted some oaks, walnuts, and pecans. I'm not the pecans didn't make it. Uh, they they didn't survive. 
there's only one or two in here that did that are still alive but the the walnuts and, and oaks most of them made it so what I'm hoping for is that what we looked at over there in that planting will, will look like this and be trees kind of like this in 20 some years so yeah that, that's a 22 year old bur oak got some others there's a nice one right there that one was here previously that well, on this 12 14 inch little tree but you know, you'll see others around that were girdled this hackberry here was killed because it was shading this guy and that guy you know, so. why girdle the trees instead of cut them down because we didn't at that time want all of the tops all uh, all on the ground at that time and we can leave them standing and uh, woodpecker you know feeding sites habitat and all that and and uh, and if we had cut them all in then they would have had all the tops on the ground and they would have just rotted on the ground <clears throat> now obviously they're going to come down there's one right there that is already blown down uh, we'll see we'll make another stop here in a little bit on a different area that uh, a windstorm come through and took several of them down already but we just decided we wanted to go ahead and leave them stand you know, cause, like I said the insects under the bark make for woodpecker feeding areas hello forestry friends we're processing walnut here today separating the good seed from the bad seed the good seed sinks the bad seed floats so I have this series of tanks set up to first soak the walnut seed for a couple days and then run it through my first float sink separator and then I pitch it from there into this tank and get another separation kind of agitate the tank a little bit do a little walnut dance and that gets all the floating seed dislodged and free for me to skim off and discard this is a pretty clean lot right now so I'm not getting too many floaters and now all my sinkers remain in the bottom and now I get to shovel it all in the good seed bin so that's how we separate the good seed from the bad seed for black walnut and all of this black walnut is going to be used to uh, establish new forests along stream sides to help those stream banks and river banks from eroding away, along with a couple other species. Thanks for checking in.